Welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in. You are listening to The Account with a report for day 439 of the war in Ukraine. Today I have two articles I want to point out. I also have an extra news segment about the latest Russian missile and drone attack on Ukraine. All other updates are grouped into the usual situation inside Ukraine, the occupied territories, Russia and Belarus, and the international developments. Before we start the news, the flashpoints along the front. Bakhmut. Russia has renewed attempts to encircle the city. Attacks were reported on Boranivka, Khomove, and Khihorivka, with particular heavy battles happening around Khomove. However, while the defenders managed to hold the front in the south and north of Bakhmut, Russia is slowly advancing inside the city. Avdivka. Continued Russian attacks have reduced Pervomaiske to rubble, which is difficult to defend for Ukraine. Therefore, Russia is slowly advancing in this area while paying a huge price in personnel. Saporizhia Front There have been reports that Russian forces are slowly falling back, most likely to better defensive positions ahead of the anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now for the first article I wanted to point out, titled Latest Ukraine satellite images reveal devastation of Russian invasion. Politico gathered satellite pictures from a number of locations in Ukraine to show what they looked like before and after Russia invaded. In particular, the photos show the destruction in Kyiv region, the aftermath of the battles near Kyiv, the destroyed airfield in Hostomel, a destroyed bridge in Irpin, and a dam in the village of Kazarovici. In addition, satellite cameras have captured Bakhmut fields peppered with shell holes and the Mariupol Drama Theater destroyed by Russian bombs. I recommend checking out the article just to understand the scale of destruction caused. The second article I wanted to point out, titled I will be here until I die. How a 75-year-old Japanese volunteer, Uminori Tsuchiko, lived with Hakif residents in the metro for six months and opened a free cafe in Hakif. Fuminori Tsuchiko is 75 years old. Almost a year ago, he moved from Tokyo to Kharkiv and has no plans to go back. This is his story and how he lived in the metro for six months together with residents of Kharkiv, helping them by providing food. He went on to open a cafe together with his Kharkiv partner, which prepares about 600 free meals a day. Fumi doesn't speak Ukrainian and barely speaks English but his actions speak louder than any words. Please check out this article. And to start the news segment, the updates on the latest Russian missile and drone attack on Ukraine. Air raid warnings were issued in Ukraine amid reported explosions in Odessa and active air defense in Kyiv. Russia attacked Ukraine with 35 Iranian-made kamikaze drones, with Ukrainian defenders destroying all of the targets. Additionally, Russia fired up to eight KH-22 cruise missiles at Odessa Oblast, some of which did not reach their target. Although all drones were intercepted, damage was reported in Kyiv. Five civilians were injured, several buildings were damaged, and falling debris caused the fire. The police also showed the wreckage of a downed Shahed drone. The Ministry of Defense of Ukraine has posted the video on social media showing the downing of Russian drones over Kyiv during the night. In Odessa, missile strikes caused fires. Three people were reportedly injured and one is missing. As a result of the Russian missile attack on Odessa Oblast, a warehouse with humanitarian aid from the Ukrainian Red Cross has been completely destroyed and the provision of aid has been suspended. A look at all the minor updates out of Ukraine. In the Sakarpatia Oblast, the Valley of Daffodils has blossomed. 80% of the area is covered in flowers. Additionally, some 200 greater flamingos have been spotted in the Tusli Lagoons National Nature Park Odessa Oblast. The Ukrainian journalist Mstislav Chernov, Evgeny Maloletka 
and Vasilisa Stepanenko have won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for the reporting from Mariupol, then under Russian siege. President Volodymyr Zelensky announced and later submitted a draft law to the Verhofna Rada, proposing that May 8th be the day of remembrance and victory over Nazism in the Second World War. Additionally, Zelensky signed a decree declaring that from tomorrow, Ukraine will annually mark Europe Day on May 9th. Ruslan Stefanchuk, chairman of the Verhofna Rada, announced that the Ukrainian parliament will consider the proposal as soon as possible. Anna Malia, deputy minister of defense of Ukraine, warned of possible Russian escalations during the May 8th and May 9th celebrations. Meanwhile, the National Police of Ukraine in Odessa Oblast will strengthen security measures, reminding residents that rallies and marches have been banned during the war. Colonel Yuri Inat, spokesperson of the Air Force of Ukraine, stated that Ukraine will boast one of the best air defense systems in the world as soon as all promised equipment has been delivered. Ukraine has formed and equipped eight new strike drone companies with funds provided by the United 24 platform and the government. Next up, the latest regarding the situation in the occupied territories. Russian occupation authorities are suspending the operation of reactors at the Saprizhia nuclear power plant, Russian state media TASS reported. Petr Andriyoschenko, the advisor to the mayor of Mariupol, reported that Mariupol is facing a drinking water crisis in the summer due to actions taken by the occupation authorities. Additionally, the Mariupol City Council wrote that Russian occupying forces in Mariupol have started mobilizing residents. Andriyoschenko further reported an unusual high activity of Russian helicopters in the occupied city. Moving on to the news updates from Russia and Belarus. The Systemi investigative project reported that Wagner has started recruiting drug dealers, citizens hiding from the police and people with Nazi tattoos. Leonid Manakov, the envoy of unrecognized Transnistria to Moscow, has called on Russia to increase the number of so-called peacekeepers due to heightened security risks in the region. Russia once again blocked the work of the Black Sea Grain Initiative by refusing to register ships for entry and inspect them. It seems Russia is considering manufacturing Shahed drones in Belarus following a visit by Iranian engineers to the country. Alexander Lukashenko, president of Belarus, has arrived in Moscow to attend the traditional May 9th Victory Day parade together with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The presidents of Kazakhstan and Tajikistan and Prime Minister of Armenia have agreed to join Russian President Vladimir Putin at the parade as well. And to wrap up the news segment, the international developments. The 11th EU sanctions package against Russia provides for the ban on access to the European ports for vessels which are trying to evade the previously imposed sanctions on Russian oil. Poland has already transferred 10 MiG-29 fighter jets to Ukraine as part of military support. The Financial Times reported that the EU is planning to sanction Chinese companies who support the Russian war effort. Former US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger believes that actual negotiations between Russia and Ukraine might happen by the end of 2023 with China's help. The High Representative of the European Union, Josep Borrell, in a phone call with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iran, has called on Iran to stop supporting Moscow in its war against Ukraine. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen will visit Kyiv on May 9th and meet with President Volodymyr Zelensky, the Commission's press service reported. And now for the intelligence report segment, starting with the UK Ministry of Defense. Russian military recruiters have been targeting Central Asian migrant workers in Russia to serve in Ukraine. Recruiters have visited mosques and immigration offices to recruit. And immigration officers, staff who speak Tajik and Uzbek, routinely attempt to recruit migrants. Radio Free Europe reported recruiters offering sign-up bonuses of 2,390 US dollars 
and salaries of up to 4,160 US dollars a month. Migrants have also been offered a fast-track Russian citizenship path of six months to one year instead of the usual five years. The high monthly salary and sign-up bonuses will entice some migrant workers to sign up. These recruits are likely sent to the Ukrainian front lines, where the casualty rate is extremely high. Recruiting migrants is part of the Russian Ministries of Defense's attempt to fulfill its target of 400,000 volunteers to fight in Ukraine. The authorities are almost certainly seeking to delay any new overt mandatory mobilization for as long as possible to minimize domestic dissent. A look at the latest assessment by the Institute for the Study of War. Wagner Group Finanzier Evgeny Prigozhin and Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov may have compared the Russian theater commander in Ukraine, Army General Valery Gerasimov, to resume artillery ammunition distribution to the Wagner forces in Bakhmut, despite Gerasimov's desired deprioritization of that effort. This assessment assumes that Prigozhin's claims that the MOD was withholding shells but has now agreed to supply them are true. The MOD has made no official statements regarding those claims, and Ukrainian officials report that they have not observed a decline in Wagner shelling during this period. Kadyrov's threats to transfer his forces to Bakhmut may have blackmailed the Russian military command into allocating ammunition to Wagner mercenaries. Kadyrov likely supported Wagner's blackmail efforts against the Russian military command in order to re-establish his position within the circle of power in the Kremlin. Gerasimov's apparent need to negotiate with subordinate commanders and those commanders' ability to force his hand suggests that chain-of-command problems are having a significant impact on the Russian military's ability to conduct coherent theater-wide operations. These events raise questions about Russia's ability to coordinate a coherent theater-wide defensive campaign. Prigozhin's and Kadyrov's ability to significantly influence the Russian military command decisions relies on Putin's willingness to appease them and his reliance on their forces, both of which will likely degrade after further blackmail efforts. Prigozhin's continued fight to complete the capture of Bakhmut contradicts his consistent narrative that capturing Bakhmut lacks strategic value. And to wrap up the report, the evening update by the General Staff of Ukraine. The enemy continues to focus its main efforts on the Liman, Bakhmut, Avdivka and Marinka directions. The enemy carried out about 30 attacks. Heavy battles are being fought for the cities of Bakhmut and Marinka. In the Liman direction, the enemy is trying to find weak points in our defense. He led offensive actions in the direction of Bilohorivka, but was unsuccessful. In the Bakhmut direction, the enemy continues to conduct offensive actions. Fighting continues in the city of Bakhmut. During the day, the enemy carried out unsuccessful offensive actions in the directions of Ivanivska and Chasiv Yar. In the Avdivka direction, the enemy carried out offensive actions in the Avdivka and Pervomaiske districts without success. In the Marinka direction, the enemy continues to attack the positions of the defense forces. Battles continue for Marinka. In the city of Skadovsk, the activity of the district and city administrations has been suspended. Thus, on the night of May 6th to 7th, the occupiers loaded documents, office equipment and other property of state institutions into motor vehicles, and already on the morning of May 7th, a large part of the Russian occupation administration left the city, together with their families. Currently, a similar situation is observed in such settlements of the region as Mikhailivka, Petrivka, Shevchenko, Shiroke, Ulyanivka and Krasne. Taking into account the multi-kilometer traffic jams that have recently formed at the entrance to Crimea and in the area of the Kerch Bridge, the invaders plan to take the documents and looted property from the state institutions of the temporarily occupied Herson Oblast by sea using a dry cargo ship through the port of the city of Berdyansk. And that's it for today's report. Should you be interested in details, you can find links to every article I mentioned in the description as usual. If you enjoyed the report and found it informative, please consider sharing it with others and giving me a like. Thank you for tuning in and have a great day.
You are listening to the account. Slava Ukraini.